Wayside for sure. It is good to see each and every one of you guys. Uh, as we prepare and get ready for worship this day, let us continue to prepare our hearts, uh, but also be mindful of the announcements we have in the bulletin. You guys see this little sheet here. This is for the Wayside Youth Pepperoni Roll Sale. And as a long-time, full-time resident of the great state of West Virginia, I was <laughs> delighted to see a pepperoni roll sale happening here at Wayside. So get those orders in. All the information's on there. There's several flavors to choose from. Even the apple cinnamon roll, which does not come with pepperoni. So just to clarify, that, that one is special and does not have pepperoni in it. Um, but you can add it yourself if you want. <laughs> but as I told you guys, this is uh, September for the Good Samaritan Center. What were we going to be collecting? Cereal. Cereal. So you see, I have, I have my yellow bag, which means I have something special in here. Cereal. And if you guys were a good, good fellow Methodist who, uh, during the transition, you probably stalked me before I got here and may have noticed on my last Sunday at Forest for Dad, I wore these. Lucky Charms Crocs. <laughs> but I do have the actual Lucky Charms Croc gibbets now, but I didn't have them. So I'm going to change into these <laughs> to remind you guys that September is Cereal Collection Month at the Good Samaritan Center. So, <laughs> so next week we might have a different pair, but remember Cereal Serial month. So let us get ready, let us prepare our hearts for worship this morning.
you think his crocs are cute when he sees socks. <laughs> <laughs> if you're able, will you please stand and join with me in the call to worship at the bottom of the open prayer. Look around what wonders we behold. We see others gathered here to worship and praise God. Each person here is a unique, beloved creation of God. Each person here is given special gifts and talents by God. Come, let us worship God who has blessed us so mightily. Let us praise God with our hearts, souls, minds, and spirits. Amen. Boundless shaper of people and nations, you are beyond our knowing. Yet closer to us than our every breath. You are before us and behind us, surrounding us with your love, and fashioning all the creation in the secret depths of your heart, with every thought, with every song, and with every prayer, to turn these fragile earthen vessels of our lives into the spirit-filled body of Christ. And you turn to page 382 for our opening hymn, Have Thine Own Way.
Absolutely, yes. Yes, we thank God for that. <laughs> Amen. Amen. That uh, Dan's uh, treatment location is, is treatable, more treatable. Okay. All right. Any others this morning? Our uh, niece and nephew are with us this morning. That is a joy for me, but a concern for my wife as she's taking them to her church this morning <laughs> to help with my son and daughter. Um, youngest, he's He's almost four, but he's he's a while. We, we we were able to have lunch with them yesterday with my sister-in-law and her husband before they went to the airport. And they're on a trip, so we'll have them until tomorrow where we get them ready to go back to school next week uh, with my in-laws down in Charleston. But it, what a joy it is to, to have them uh, with us for at least two evenings. Uh, I was hoping to bring them here this morning, but we were just, you know, still eating that cereal this morning when I left the house. So... <laughs> But uh, it is a blessing to have them with us. Uh, so we do pray for safe travels as we travel uh, to Charleston tomorrow to uh, do the swap. So, any others this morning? Any unspoken concerns? The Lord knows each and every one of those that are on our hearts. And um, I'm so appreciative of that, of a, of a loving God who listens and knows knows us in and out. And Jeremy, mm -hmm. I would like to say that Sandy Moore and her husband have been on a trip to Scotland for the past two weeks. And I think they have one more week before they come back. All right. So she hadn't mentioned it, but I thought we need to keep them in our prayers. Yes, yes definitely keep them in our prayers. They were going to be gone for three weeks, and uh, we'll be looking forward to hearing about that trip. I'm sure right. they have lots of stories and then memories that they're making now. Justin? We need to keep our military uh, mm -hmm. people in our prayers. Absolutely. The, uh, the ones that serve the Lord. Mm -hmm. Yes, remember our military. Thank you for bringing that up and reminding us of that, that sacrifice that they make for, for us here in this country to have the freedoms that we do have. Thank you, Jess. Let us take... Oh, sorry. I'd like to have continued prayer for Justin's stepfather's having medical issues. For Justin's stepfather's issues? Yeah, he is. He is home. He's home now, but is still in pain. So do remember him in your prayers. Let us take time now to go to God in prayer, shall we? Gracious God, as we gather in this place, whether online, in the parking lot, or here in the sanctuary, we gather on this day that we hear the rain, we hear the rain as the cars drive by, but we still know that your love is there, whether it's sunshine, whether it's rain. And when seasons change, when they come and go, that your presence is always there. And we feel that today. We are thankful. We are thankful for your Holy Spirit that works within each and every one of us, that guides us, that leads us, and directs us. In our past. Lord, as we come before you this day, giving you thanks for all the joys that we've experienced throughout this past week, again, we come with burdens, with heavy hearts, for loss, for pain, for suffering, for broken hearts, for our friends and family. And Lord, we lay it all down. And Lord, we ask you once again to help us pick up the pieces. Help us be the strength and the presence of God for others in their lives as they are going through these situations we've uplifted. For those spoken and those unspoken. Lord, you know each and every one of them, and we give you thanks for that. So Lord, as we Continue to gather here, lifting your name on high, giving you praise and thanksgiving for it all. We ask this now that you continue to be with us. Let us hear your word and what you have for us this day. And be present here with us as we join and meet together at your holy table. We are so thankful that we are able to do that. That you have set aside this part of our service today 
to meet us as we experience just a bit of what is to come in heaven. And we give you thanks for that. In your name we pray. It's time now we would invite our ushers to come forward as we receive this morning's offering.
righteous God. Through your Son, you have called us to God. The gifts we offer this day are only a small token of affirmation that we accept that call. If we embrace the full meaning of that call, we would give our whole being to the offering. In many cases, we've allowed ourselves to believe that the communion offers and an hour on Sunday is the cost of discipleship. Help us to stop fooling ourselves and consider the full cost of discipleship that means something, that is capable of transforming the world. By your grace and with the help of Jesus, we pray. The Old Testament lesson this morning is from Jeremiah 18, verses 1 through 11. Jeremiah received the Lord's word. Go down to the potter's house, and I'll give you instructions about what to do there. So I went down to the potter's house. He was working on the potter's wheel. But the piece he was making was flawed while still in his hands, so the potter started on another as seemed best to him. Then the Lord's word came to me, House of Israel, can't I deal with you like this potter, declares the Lord. Like clay in the potter's hand, so are you in mine, House of Israel. At any time I may announce that I will dig up, pull down, and destroy a nation or kingdom. But if that nation I warned turns from its evil, then I'll relent and not carry out the harm I intended for. At the same time, I may announce that I will build and plant a nation or kingdom. But if that nation displeases or disobeys me, then I'll relent and not carry out the good I intended for it. Now I say to the people of Judah and those living in Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says. I am a potter preparing a disaster for you. I'm working out a plan against you. So each one of you, turn from your evil ways, reform your ways, and your actions. This is the word of God for the people of God. Our New Testament, our gospel lesson is from Luke. Luke 14, verse 1, 7 through 14. One Sabbath, when Jesus went to share a meal in the home of one of the leaders of the Pharisees, they were watching him closely. When Jesus noticed how the guests sought out the best seats at the table, he told them a parable. When someone invites you to a wedding, well, to a wedding celebration, don't take your seat in the place of honor. Someone more highly regarded than you could have been invited by your host. The host invited both of you will come and say to you, give your seat to the other person, embarrassed, and you will take your seat in the least important place. I think this is the wrong house for us. This is the gospel lesson from last week. It was in the bulletin. This one is supposed to be Luke 14, 25 to 33. Is that correct? Large crowds were traveling with Jesus. Turning to them, he said, whoever comes to me and doesn't hate father and mother, spouse and children, and brothers and sisters, Yes, even one's own life cannot be my disciple. Whoever doesn't carry their own cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. If one of you wanted to build a tower, wouldn't you first sit down and calculate the cost to determine whether you have enough money to complete it? Otherwise, when you have laid the foundation but couldn't finish the tower, 
all who see it will begin to belittle you. They will say, here's the person who began construction and couldn't complete it. Or what king would go to war against another king without first sitting down to consider whether his 10,000 soldiers could go up against 20,000 coming against him. And if he didn't think he could win, he would send a representative to discuss terms of peace while his enemy was still a long way off. In the same way, none of you who are unwilling to give up all of your possessions can be my disciple. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks. This morning, church, we have switched into uh, focusing on some New Testament lessons as our main preaching focus, and we'll start a uh, seven-week series into the letters that Paul wrote to his friend Timothy. But today we're going to look at, and we're going to actually read a whole book of the Bible, so bear with me, it is the shortest book in the Bible. <laughs> this is uh, the book Philemon. So hear these words, church. From Paul, who was a prisoner for the cause of Christ Jesus and our brother Timothy, to Philemon, our dearly loved co-worker, Aphia, our sister, Archippus, our fellow soldier in the church that meets in your house, may the grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Philemon, I thank my God every time I mention you in my prayers, because I've heard of your love and faithfulness which you have both for the Lord Jesus and for all God's people. I pray that your partnership in the faith might become effective by an understanding of all that is good among us in Christ. I have great joy and encouragement because of your love, since the hearts of God's people are refreshed by your actions, my brother. Therefore, though I have enough confidence in Christ to command you to do the right thing, I would rather appeal to you through love. I, Paul, an old man and now also a prisoner for Christ Jesus, appeal to you for my child Onesimus. I became his father in the faith during my time in prison. He was useless to you before, but now he is useful to both of us. I'm sending him back to you, which is like sending you my own heart. I consider keeping him with me so that he might serve me in your place during my time in prison because of the gospel. However, I didn't want to do anything without your consent so that your act of kindness would occur willingly and not under pressure. Maybe this is the reason that Onesimus was separated from you for a while so that you might have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but more than a slave, that is, as a dearly loved brother. He is especially a dearly loved brother to me. How much more can he become brother to you personally and spiritually in the Lord? So if you really consider me a partner, welcome Onesimus as if you were welcoming me. If he has harmed you in any way or owes you money, charge it to my account. I, Paul, will pay it back to you. I'm writing this with my own hand. Of course, I won't mention that you owe me your life. Yes, brother, I want this favor from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. I'm writing to you confident of your obedience and knowing that you will do more than what I ask. Also, one more thing. Prepare a guest room for me. I hope that I will be released from prison to be with you because of your prayers. Epaphras, who is in prison with me for the cause of Christ Jesus, greets you, as well as my co-workers, Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Let me pray. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. And get me behind the cross so that your glory and not mine might shine through. And in spite of the stammerings of my speech and the inconsistencies of my character, may your word be proclaimed and heard here today. Amen. 
Church, with this being Labor Day weekend, I couldn't help but notice the theme of labor and work that was referenced throughout today's scripture readings. From Jeremiah's text, we heard about the potter and the clay, and as God is at work, as the potter working on us and creating in us a new path, God is the worker for our good. And in our opening prayer, the psalm it was based on the psalm this morning. We see God at working at work again, creating us and knitting us together in our mother's womb. God is at work again. And as well in the gospel text where we see Jesus refer to his following him as picking up our crosses, not just once, but daily. Picking up and going to work each and every day. Laboring alongside Christ is not just a one-time thing but a daily task we must do. And finally, with today's New Testament lesson, we see the story of a worker, of a slave, who had fled from his position and ran away. A worker who later found Christ and changed his heart and allowed God to then do the work in him so that he could be put back to work and put on a path of restoration for the work of the kingdom. So today, as we dive into this text, let us first acknowledge what occurred for Paul to have written this letter. Now, first of all, this text is, in fact, one of my favorite books in the Bible, not just because it's the shortest. For my favorite Bible verse is not Jesus wept either, for those who keep in track. But it is one of the shortest books in the Bible. It's only one chapter. And in that one chapter, there were 25 verses. While the Revised Common Lectionary calls for us to only read the first 21 verses, I went ahead and decided I would do the work today and read those extra few verses. After all, it is Labor Day weekend. But before I even knew what the revised, how the Revised Common Lectionary works, during our first years in pastoral ministry, me and my wife would alternate weeks, and it was my week to preach, and I said, you know what, Aaron, Pastor Aaron, I'm going to go rogue this week. I'm going to go with my favorite verse, and my favorite story in the book of Philemon. Well, little did we know that when we checked to see just in case what the lectionary readings were that week, it was this week. The one week in a three-year cycle where the shortest book, the only time the shortest book in the Bible is mentioned, the book of Philemon, that was that week. So not only did that reinforce our love and respect for the, that, those that put together the Revised Common Lectionary, but it also helped me be in tune with the Holy Spirit to see where he wanted my focus to be that week. Granted, I have now preached on finally in three out of four possible Revised Common Lectionary years, and for those at my last church know that in 2019 we had a new senior pastor who preached a little bit more to get his ministry started there. But I prayed about it this year. I said, Lord, it's, it's, it's this text. Am I going to default to this text? Or are you going to have me preach on something new, something different? And God reinforced that theme of forgiveness that's found in this text for this week. Now, for those in 2025, make a note to see what I preach on that week when it's time for this text again. But today's text offers a glimpse into the biblical forgiveness that has helped me many times over the years to realize that our personal beliefs, our feelings, and our preferences should not get in the way of us seeing and serving the Lord and recognizing this unbelievable forgiveness that he offers. This unbelievable forgiveness that we've been given that in turn we are to give and show to others. So in this story, if we kind of put it in today's terms, Onesimus is an employee who quits and runs away, and with him takes the company laptop and has the personal property on him. Now, a wise man once said that playing with my money is like playing with my emotions, so when you mess with people's business, people can hold grudges. Feelings can be hurt. But this isn't a new concept either. People don't like it when you mess with their income. If you know anything about Jesus doing this before in his ministry, in Mark's gospel and Luke's gospel, we hear a tale of Jesus sending demons out of a man into a bunch of pigs. And at first there was this miraculous cheering. They were excited to see that the demons were cast out. 
But then they realized, wait a second, we deal in pigs. Our money just jumped over the cliff. And what did they do? They told Jesus to leave immediately. It didn't matter that this man was no longer possessed by demons. They were upset that their form of income had jumped the cliff. So again, people don't like it when you mess with their income and their form of, of business. But what we have here is a slave who runs away. It doesn't say for how long that he was gone. But he somehow runs into Paul. And Paul then introduces him, like he did to many, to, to Jesus Christ. And Onesimus accepted Christ in his life and became a believer and a follower of our Lord and Savior. You see, church, our past may have taken us down different paths, different circumstances. But once we encounter Jesus Christ, our future is what changes. And this is what happened to the slave Onesimus. And this is what can happen to all of us today. Despite what path we've taken, despite where we've been, what our history says about us, the way we've lived our lives up until this point, we are given grace for a second chance. So if you can hear these words, it's not too late. See, church, Paul's awareness of what can happen here. He knows the pain and the damage that was done to Philemon when he lost his slave, his worker. He knows he can't just send him back and expect things to go back to normal. Because Onesimus has given his heart to the Lord, they are now brothers and sisters in Christ. His status has since been changed. Verse 15 says, Perhaps this is the reason he was separated from you for a while, so that you might have him back forever. His status has changed. He is now a brother in Christ. Now, Onesimus might not understand in the long run why it was that he left and fleed from his position. Philemon might not understand why his slave left for an undisclosed amount of time. Just like we may never know why we go through trials, why we experience situations in our lives. We may have a list a thousand miles long by the time we get to heaven on why this, why that. We may never know the reasons for the lies. And Philemon probably thought that he would never see Onesimus again, and if he did, I'm sure he probably had some few words and actions he would like to have taken upon the return. So it's interesting to me that Philemon is the one uh, receiving this letter, and Onesimus is the one who's handing it to him. And Onesimus has to sit there and wait for him to read this. And Paul puts all this love language at the beginning and hopes that it will stir his heart into welcoming this slave back. I can only imagine what was going through Philemon's mind when he's looking at his slave, if he even recognized him, while he's getting through Paul's letter and Paul's appeal out of love, what that must have been like. But with Paul in his letter, he was asking Philemon to consider this good thing. He was separated you for a while, and during that while, he found Christ. Amen? Things had changed in his life. Now, the reason this book speaks to me is because I tried living life as a Christian, as a Sunday school teacher, as a committee member on all the committees you could ever list, as a lay leader, for far too long while having unforgiveness in my heart, while holding grudges to family members for things that I had thought meant the world to me at the time that would prevent me from truly living out my call. Family members causing unforgiveness in my heart. Let my walk be hindered. There was even a time that I tried to teach this very lesson on Philemon to a group of high school kids who had gotten a fight the week before. But guess what? The next week, none of them showed up. But here I was living with this in my heart, this hardened heart. So what is Paul to do here? He doesn't want to force Philemon to take Onesimus back again. Instead, he pleads with him based on their newfound common ground. Philemon, Paul, and now Onesimus again are all brothers in Christ. Verse 17 says, So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. 
Those words are powerful, church. Charge that to my account. Who does that sound like? It sounds like Paul is being, being very Christ-like in this letter. He's going out and saying, look, I know this man has wronged you. He has left you, stolen from you, done horrible things. But he now knows Christ. He is now a believer just like you and me. And of all people to know what it was like to live a life against Christ and for Christ, Paul knows all about that. One of the commentaries I read said, By doing so, he eloquently makes the point that he is one slave making an appeal on the behalf of another slave. Which, in essence, aren't we all just one sinner trying to tell another sinner about Jesus Christ? See, Paul is also stressing to his friend that he wants to do something so great that it doesn't even come close to whatever it is he already owes him for. See, church, this was special. This was God. This was God softening the heart of a man, a master who was betrayed by his slave. And only by the power of God could something like this happen. You see, God uses big and sometimes messy circumstances to show his love, to show those that might not be accepting of the gospel, to see him truly at work through this forgiveness. You see, holding grudges doesn't accomplish anything. One of the stories that speaks to me when I read this is a story of my sister-in-law, who uh, the one that we're watching her kids this weekend for. You see, several years ago, we were uh, in the process of, of purchasing my, my in-law's house to move into, and they were all going to be moving to Tennessee. She wanted to pursue a career in music, and this was an opportunity for our small family to have a, a larger space. So we graciously moved in with my in-laws for a season. And then a few months later, she gets engaged, and the plans change. And instantly, I felt this hardened heart of mine, this upset that our lives had been changed to help them, and then it turned out that we didn't have to go through all that we went through. And for years, I had this grudge that I was holding on to. And one time after studying this scripture and the Lord speaking to me, I went to her and I said, I am so sorry I've held this grudge for years and I just want to let you know that I forgive you. And she said, for what? <laughs> you see, this whole time she didn't know what was in my heart. I had been doing all the worrying. I had been doing all the stressing. I had worried myself sick, literally sick over this. And it didn't affect her at all. It was only hurting me. It was only hurting me and my family and my ministry. But here we are several years later. Again, as we're able to love on her family and watch those beautiful kids of hers, life has a certain way of changing things with a changed heart. You see, sometimes we as Christians, we let our fleshly nature come out. And we forget that we are a forgiven person ourselves. And we are wasting time refusing to forgive those in our lives who have done us wrong. So again, each time I read this book, I think about the people in the town where Philemon lived. I think about what the looks on their faces might have been. Those who just knew how much Philemon was hurt when his slave left. And to see Onesimus walk back, I bet they thought, uh-oh, it's going down now. He's finally going to get his revenge. He's going to give him a piece of his mind. And it reminds me a few weeks ago of the restoration that took place in the woman who was bent over for 18 years, who was able to stand because of the healing touch of God, who was able to give God praise, and was, who was able to go back to her community. And what difference that made, that people can see a change. In her, it was physically and spiritually. And for Onesimus to walk back into the town in which he had fleed from, that's also how I picture him having that same impact on that community where he comes back with this letter from Paul and being graciously is accepted by Philemon back into life, both spiritually and physically. Now both able to serve God in mighty ways. For the community to see that forgiving power Again, that can only happen through the love of God and through Jesus Christ. 
I'm not sure if you know this or not, but people expect the worst in all situations. Have you ever watched the news? So seriously, how awesome would it be for them to see the opposite of what they were expecting to happen through the love of God? That's what sticks out to me this week, church. And that's what I believe God wants us to remember. That his love is greater, greater than any anger, greater than any pride that we may have, greater than anything that the world is telling and expecting of us. Now in a time of COVID, a time of not being able to be the church like we've always been, we may have lost contact with some of our folks. Now don't argue with them, don't make a big scene if they were to walk back into the sanctuary. Welcome them with loving arms, invite them back into the life of the church, just like your fellow brothers and sisters who are here today. You see, church, God is great, and God is love, and God is challenging us to live like Christ, to love one another, and more importantly, to forgive one another as well. Now, the irony of all this, that in the Greek, the name Onesimus means useful. And we saw Paul play on those words in his address, where he said he was no longer useless, but he is now useful to the kingdom. And I believe what we need to do is stop allowing our unforgiveness to be useless and allow our testimony of forgiving someone be useful. Not only you and not those that you are forgiving, but for all those out there who you, our lives, that see us each and every day. Because believe it or not, as Christians, people look at us a little different and are watching us carefully to see how we react to situations just like this. Which brings me to the Lord's Prayer that we're getting ready to say. Remember these words. Forgive us our trespass as we forgive those who trespass against us. Church, we must be ready to forgive people. Just as we expect to be forgiven by God. So as we prepare our hearts for meeting together at this table, let us truly forgive those who we've yet to forgive. Let us prepare. Creator of the harvest, we lift our voices in praise. Creator of the table, in you we find our peace. In gratitude we gather to share this meal. With thanksgiving we gather to share our love for neighbor. As the sun sets earlier, the days become cooler, and the crops near harvest, we celebrate the plenitude of fruits available to us. We acknowledge the ways that we can use our gifts to care for our siblings in need. And we extend this table through the work of our hands and the mission of this church. As we celebrate this sacrament, may we remember the laborers in the field, the harvesters of the wheat and grapes, the transporters of their yields, those who transform wheat into bread and grapes into juice. Bless their hands and feet as they labor at farms and gardens, in trucks and warehouses. We give thanks for the one who prepares the table here for us today. May their gifts of preparation and hospitality inspire us to extend hospitality to the strangers among us. After laboring on the streets of Jerusalem, doing justice, loving kindness, and walking humbly with God, Jesus clutched bread in his hand. Fully thanks 
fully expressed thanksgiving for his friends and those that were there. He said, as you eat bread, remember me. And after the supper, Jesus grasped the cup filled with gifts of the vine. And in his blessing, he reminded them, whenever you drink of this cup, remember me. The spirit of wisdom and of wonder wind around these elements today. May they stir us from stagnation into actively loving God, our neighbors and ourselves. May our participation at this very table transform us into the people God is calling us to be. With gratitude, we gather at this table. As we take a piece of bread, let us experience the love of God as seen in Jesus Christ. As we immerse the bread into the cup, let us remember the grace that pours from God. And if we can, let us all join together in the prayer that Jesus taught those disciples when he taught them to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And we us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power. The bread is ready. The cup is filled. The table is set. Let all who are hungry for the love of God come and be fed. Let all who are thirsty for new life come and share the cup. Let all who want to follow Jesus come and feast at this table. In church, we do have gluten-free options that we will have, and I will need a someone to assist me in serving this morning uh, in sharing, but all are welcome at this table. As United Methodists, we have an open communion table.
Let us pray. God, we give you thanks for this table. We give you thanks for this time that has been set apart where we can meet you in this special moment. Lord, continue to be with us as we give you praise and give you thanks for the loving God and caring God that you are. And remember that to do this as often as we eat and drink, for the remembrance of you, in your name we give you thanks. Amen. Amen. Now, would you please stand and join us in our closing hymn?
with open hearts, go forth to follow Jesus in love and in service to the world. In his name I say, Jesus.